so what's the what's the state of the uh, of the market today, Keith, in, in terms of um, uh, tests that that people listening to this can actually get as part of a a, a cancer screening uh, protocol? So so yeah, so Grail yeah. has a commercially available kit. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. you know it's not over the counter. You need to get it through a physician. Um, yeah. What what are some other tests out there? And in your view, how close are we to these tests being an imperative part of cancer screening? Yeah, I, I, I think we're not quite at the imperative point, but we're uh, we're certainly at the point where I would say it's reasonable to get a test. I mean, right, if you consider yourself an early adopter yep. and you know who you are, um, it's reasonable to get a test. Um, it's, you know, and, and, and just quickly to answer your question, uh, the first part of your question, uh, there's a test that was initially developed by a company called Thrive that was acquired by Exact, um, and they, they, they have a commercially available test as well. And then another company called Delphi um, have a commercially available test, which are all all have performance characteristics that are, you know, in the same realm um, in terms of supporting, uh, you know, their their current clinical use. Uh, but here's the concern um, that many people have, which is um, that basically we're at a state in the field where finding people who are blood positive, blood test positive, um, could lead to a large degree of anxiety in terms of then you do you know standard standard radiographic assessment you don't find the problem and that and that basically the medical community and because we're not talking about oncologists you know, yeah. who are doing the tests right so um, the medical community um, really hasn't had time to really kind of work out the kinks of like how do we manage this situation and so you can almost argue that there need to be you know generalists who you know kind of really develop expertise you know kind of content knowledge yeah. Have a network of specialists that they can work with to be able, you know to be able to kind of catch these patients, um, and these tests were launched you know before that was really created. So that, that's just my PSA here, yeah, yeah. my public service announcement <laughs> in terms of um, the fact that you just like you know if you just get a test and you're not in the hands of someone who can you know kind of manage um, a positive test, uh, I think that 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 is at least anxiety provoking. But the, and the technology will is is I mean again it's. We, we've, uh, with collaborators of ours, uh, we've actually been doing like direct head to head comparison, uh, you know, kind of analyses, like of how much lower can we go in terms of, you know, amount of, of uh, tumor DNA in the blood that can be detected with, you know, what are currently R and D methods, but are readily scalable. Um, we're really at a hundred x better. I mean, it's like it, it, this is it's and, you know that it's at that point it, you're talking about a finger drop of blood if you're a hundred x yeah, better well, than ten ml. Well, you mean? Yeah, but okay, that's true. You could take it in that direction, but we actually you would we, say no. Stay with ten or twenty ml. Ten ml, and we exactly. are way more sensitive. Yes. Oh, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. I mean, right. So that so that's the point, and and then and then do serial analyses, right? Yeah. Do multi, you know, so like in the in go with high risk populations to prove this point if you like. But so we 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 can readily envision how it is that we basically start to capture you know a much bigger um, uh, section of the population. It's it's a little hard to estimate right now, basically, until we do more studies. What's differentiating these companies? So if you just look at Delphi yeah. and Grail, and, and is it the, I mean, you know, so sort of, so Grail to me, I have no interest, I have no uh, uh, affiliation with any of these companies. Right. We use Grail right. in our patients. Um, sure. When we do, we don't do this in everybody for exactly the reasons you've stated. I, you got to be able to tolerate the uh, the the noise that may come of these tests. That's sort of our view of aggressive cancer screening in general. But but when we use it, we do use Grail. And that's largely based on the affiliation with Illumina, right? Which is, yep. if you've got the best sequencing company in the world that created the engine for this thing, then, I mean, yep. that, that sort of makes sense to me. But but what else differentiates these companies? Yeah, it's basically, uh, there's, I mean, there's three three kind of aspects to circulating tumor DNA that we, n we now know um, if you pay maximal attention to, you can increase your sensitivity, you can find, you know, find more uh, cancers. So I started with mutations, that's like, that's kind of the you know, first principle. Then comes the so-called fragment length. So fragmentomics, if you will, or it, its own field, uh, separate from, you know, uh, first generation genomics. Um, and that, uh, and, and, you know, Delphi basically, like basically came out of that scientific discovery that circulating tumor DNA basically um, comes in different Fragment sizes um, than normal cell uh, DNA, and that that basically, it, this is a, a kind of population phenomenon. Where you're measuring multiple, well, many, many um, circulating DNA fragments, um, and tuning your algorithm uh, ultimately to be able to kind of find the sweet spot of differentiation. That that is that's definitely part of the formula, and I, I would argue that just everybody's going to rise to that. Um, 
you know, uh, inclusion of that method. And then that methylation yep. um, aspect that I talked about before, that, that, that's, that's the other feature that has been a differentiator um, in terms of kind of the, the first marketed products um, in this class, um, even across these three companies. But there are 10 more companies coming right behind. So basically, the the first one is kind of not valuable for pan screening because that's that's your that's how you're checking for recurrence when you know the mutation, right? I mean, we're not going to be able to screen people on the basis of guessing cancer mutations, are we? Uh, no, no. Some would argue we can. I mean, as the cost of sequencing continues to nosedive, um, believe it or not, um, still still going down uh, lower and lower uh, cost, uh, you know, per you know mm. unit of um, of sequencing done. No, there were there are some who argue actually no no we just we go after you know pick a number you know the thousand most common cancer mutations the ten thousand most common the hundred thousand most common cancer mutations yeah I mean I guess if you had KRAS and you had like if you you know and P fifty three yeah P fifty three and yeah BRAS right which is P fifty three is mutated in in fifty percent of all cancers now it turns out the problem is hundreds of different P fifty three exactly yeah 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 it's a big gene but it but but still so this the people used to object to that. Concept yeah. based just on a sequencing cost, yeah. um, you know, uh, uh, argument, but that that I think is becoming less and less relevant. So yeah, so that that first feature doesn't require that customization, which is what's being done in the post surgical setting. You alluded yeah. to that, but just to make sure that people understand that that's that that tech. Yeah, when Good you point. know what mutations exist in the resected tumor, it does allow you to create very very sensitive tests for that patient, and that's what's being done and commercially. Are these bespoke? Um, assays uh, based on what comes out uh, in the surgical specimen. But when you don't know what you're looking for, the argument is if you do enough sequencing, um, you, you, you'll find them. Which companies are do? Are there companies or is that all done in the lab right now? Are there, are there companies that are actually taking, no. it's not it's not yet commercialized? No, no. But it, I mean, but it's, this is, like, there's a real, I mean, I mentioned this briefly before, there's just a, a real scale up in investment in this area, which is incredibly heartening to see. Yeah. I mean, I used to complain for so much of my career about the fact that diagnostics just didn't get the same investment that therapeutics got because the you know, sure. return on investment yeah. just fundamentally different, like you know, fundamentally different um, between the two domains. And yet, as clinicians, like we we need the diagnostics. We can't even we can't even think about therapeutics until we you know. Well, that's that's the irony of it, right? Is that people talk about oh, we'd really love to lower healthcare costs. Yeah, yeah. You need earlier and better diagnostics. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like it's just it's just it's just such a no brainer right. that you uh, yeah, could you know. Yeah. It, I think it's wise to be upset about the cost of oncology therapeutics that are adding yeah. no value. But right. you spend a tenth of that on the diagnostics, you make that problem right. irrelevant. Exactly right. That's right. And and then the durations of therapy that we need to give people yep. you know, to have curative outcome. I mean, like you, you solve so yeah, many yeah. problems. You, you just say, we're, we're, we're right. turning this into yeah. a lock and key model from exactly. diagnostic to therapeutic. Keith, right. we're just about out of time. So I want to kind of end with, with, a, with a question that you may not be able to answer, but it's worth asking anyway. Um, you know, I think of you and, and, and people I know like you as the most remarkable, you know, oncology advocates, meaning I know that if one of my patients comes down with uh, cancer, I can call you up and say, Keith, I've got this woman. It's a very unusual breast cancer. It's, you know, it's, it's her two new positive, but ERPR negative. There's something funky about it going on. Who do you like? Who should she be mm -hmm, seeing? Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and let's say there's another situation where a traditional therapy is failing and, and you know, you're going to point me in the direction of, um, mm -hmm. of where, to, where there's a clinical trial that's promising, mm -hmm. not just a phase mm -hmm. one that's like probably got no hope, but here's a, here's a phase two that really has some hope. Okay, so like there should be an entire industry of Keith Flaherty's who are there to be consulted by um, families who find themselves in this in this situation because again we come back to how we started this discussion there's nobody listening to us right now or watching us right now mm -hmm. who hasn't been touched or will not be touched by cancer and even if it's a cancer that ultimately doesn't kill them which again in about half the cases it won't actually kill you you will need help navigating the system and the disparity in cancer care in this country, uh, and probably in most countries, is significant. And therefore, it does matter who you know. It does matter which expert points you to the best treatment center. So because I can't clone Keith and a dozen other people that I know that I can pick up the phone and call, what, what does that look like? I mean, what, what, what can somebody do 
when they when they get that bad news. This drives me crazy uh, what you're talking about in terms of access to expert opinion um, when you need expert opinion and and particularly for complex, unique um, outlier cases, if you will. And, 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 we're, and you don't know as a patient or a family member whether you're you know um, dealing with a middle of the road case, right? How how would you know? Yeah. Um, and and this is where um, basically so f- first off like we. We we need to pool our insights, if you will, right? Like like, like break down the silos of you know hospitals and centers and universities and whatever, um, and pool our you know kind of you know opinions. Uh, that's kind of point number one. Point number two is we need to leverage technology for this purpose. Like this is, I mean, this I, like people get all excited about artificial intelligence mm-hmm. in terms of its you know its in, how it's informing you know chemistry advances and and the like. And 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 you know I'm excited about those things too, but. But and, and then other aspects of you know biology discovery and all that. But this is the this is the most obvious use basically, right? Is that you essentially you you start to you know like build the database essentially of of opinions um, that you know that like I and others you know offer to specific cancer cases based on certain aspects of their diagnosis, right? And and the patterns are like. These are not hard for a machine to, <laughs> to figure yeah. out. I mean, a human could figure it out. No, it's just, it's sort of codifying what you do, what you do very easily as the yes. teaching set for the AI. Exactly. And what I'm getting at is within the 95 percent, you know, boundary of you know of you know kind of typical cases. Um, basically, you, you, I mean, you really could you could the decision support can really be based on you know the last 100 cases that i and my you know yep. other melanoma colleagues have seen that are you know just like this um, and then the edge cases is where we need to apply our specific attention right and there i think there are actually enough of us to yep. handle the edge cases um, uh, the problem is that we like the way our system works is like nobody knows what their complexity of their diagnosis is so they're right so they basically are, are like everybody's seeking you know the same level of care and and you know sort of decision making um, Without that understanding, and and I, we can get way ahead of this, and 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 be transparent in explaining, like, look, you know, here's why we're saying you've got a very typical case. We have a ton of outcome data. Yep. We, you know, we know we know what therapy um, is is the very best. And then, like, you know, the issue of like therapeutic access and like investigational therapies that are, you know, crossing the divide and are showing real responses in real human beings and should be considered, you know, as a certain priority, maybe not the top priority, but a backup option or something. That's also. <laughs> Like that is like that is just not um, rocket science, um, and you shouldn't have to get on an airplane, never go see anybody. But even on the Zoom screen, I mean, honestly, this is we, we are so inefficient in terms of how it is that we disseminate information. Um, it drives me crazy, and um, there are very few entities, but are a few um, that are working on this problem and and kind of see it this way. This is you throw some technology at this problem, I think this this goes away. So what is the best thing that one could do now? What are what are the companies that are out there that are trying to do this now that are reputable in your mind? Yeah, I mean, N of One's been at this for a long time, and they this is still a model that they're um, I think quite good at. Um, but but not the accumulating of the database and the you yeah. know kind of again figuring out how to you know um, you know uh, you know kind of focus attention, if you will. Um, there's a company I know called Xcures that's doing um, exactly this kind of work. Mm-hmm. I mean, but it's still it's still at the Helping individual patients navigate level right now. Yep. What I'm, you know, the the, the yeah, next it's, turn it's, of the crank. it's not the full. The, it's not the yeah. full insight yeah. machine. That's know? right. That's right. Yeah, but that, but it's going to come. I mean, I I mean, this is another area that is like investment. Yeah. You know, under under invested. Um, and I would really, I mean, I, I would really like to see this because we we otherwise, as you know, we're kind of blowing the bank on a very efficient um, system as it stands right now, and it's not it's not scalable. Certainly not globally scalable. Uh-huh.